Welcome and thanks for joining us for this special panel. I'm WTOP's Capitol Hill correspondent Mitchell Miller and the panel is taking action to ensure fairness and equity in housing, how government and the real estate industry can work together. Sponsored by Bright MLS on WTOP.com. My guests today are Amit Kalkarni, the Chief Marketing Officer for Bright MLS, Dr. Lisa Sturtevant, the Chief Economist for Bright MLS, and Congressman Glenn Ivey, the U.S. Representative for Maryland's 4th District. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So buying a home for the vast majority of Americans is the biggest financial decision that they'll ever make. And while a great deal of progress has been made over the years, it's still very difficult, as we know, to achieve the American dream. So I'm going to start with you, uh, Lisa, mm -hmm. uh, and the challenges related to fair and equitable housing. Uh, why is access to housing and home ownership such a critical part of economic well-being for people? Yeah, no, absolutely. Home ownership is the primary way by which Americans accumulate wealth. And we have seen over the past few years that the delay in access to home ownership just delays that access to wealth creation. Uh, each year that home ownership is delayed, it's less time able to uh, accumulate that wealth, accumulate that equity. And we've seen over the last 60 years, there's been a lot of efforts to try and close the gap in home ownership between white and non-white households in the US. And unfortunately, if you look back at the home ownership rate uh, of white households and non-white households in the US, that gap is still as large as it is, as, as, as large today as it was back when the Fair Housing Act was passed back in 1968. And so while there have been a lot of efforts underway to close that home ownership gap to allow uh, wealth creation opportunities to be uh, experienced more broadly, we still have a long way to go. But I will say it's not just about economic well-being, which of course is critically important, but we know from research that access to stable and affordable housing has a lot of great social uh, positive outcomes, good for communities, good for kids when they don't have to uh, switch schools a lot. There's just all sorts of reasons to be concerned about the fact that not everybody has access to housing um, in a way to uh, accumulate those benefits. And Congressman, um, touching on that, why is affordable housing such an important issue for you, your constituents, and the district? Well, I mean, as, as I just mentioned a moment ago, I think from the standpoint of wealth uh, development uh, and legacy wealth, mm -hmm. passing it on to your family, uh, it is the primary investment vehicle for most families. Uh, my family, for example, my, uh, my parents bought their first house for $29,000 in Dale City, Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's you know, over a million dollar uh, property at this point that, that they had been living in before. And, you know, that's happening for me and my wife, Jolene. And, um, you know, so you can see how that has an impact overall. You, you know, we didn't, nothing, no great, you know, you, we're not the uh, wizards of Omaha in, in the <laughs> stock market. You know, you just bought a house in the area and hit the, hit the timing in the right way. And it can really be transformative in that sense. Another aspect is schools uh, for a lot of communities where your house is isn't the sole factor, but it's a primary factor in which school you get to go to. And so you have people selecting their houses based on the school district, and that can have a huge impact as well. Mm -hmm. And Amit, could you explain the role of MLS in the housing market? How does MLS support fair housing uh, through the transparency of listings and other things? So. If I think about housing, it's really a fundamental human right, right? Food, water, shelter. Shelter is that third basic human right. And our view is that everybody, regardless of race, color, uh, sexual orientation, whatever, should have the same ability to access home ownership. And I think that's where the MLS comes in, because what we want to do is we want to provide a, a place where everybody, regardless of what their station in life is or any other criteria, has the same ability to access any home for sale, the only barometer being, can you afford that home? And I think that's what the MLS provides, is it's a really a, a database of homes that are uh, accessible by anybody who's in the market. And I think this is very unique to the United States because there are other places across the world that, that is not, uh, that's not the norm. It's really based on who you are and who you know. And as we know, this country has kind of a long sorted history and discrimination in housing. And I don't think we want to go back to that. And other countries um, are trying to get to the US form of the MLS system to create these equitable, fair housing marketplaces. And, um, I think, um, in, in fact, Mitchell, um, just this past weekend in Paris, France, there is an international MLS forum where real estate people from all over the world are coming together to see how they can emulate the U.S. system so that they can create hmm. better, more transparent, efficient, equitable marketplaces for their countries. So 
Uh, to me, I think the MLS is really foundational and critical to fair housing uh, in this country because without the MLS, we're going back to um, a system of who you are and who you know. And Mitchell, if you don't like me, uh, you're not going to tell me the homes you have and vice versa, right? And I don't think we want that system. We want everybody to be able to access all the homes for sale. Right, and equal access to housing has been the ideal, uh, but as you noted, uh, there's been implicit and explicit bias in housing markets. Uh, can you address the issue of pocket listings and how these can hurt consumers? So um, I'll just say that we're not a fan of pocket listings. Now, there might be some reasons, um, edge cases really, where you might want to do a pocket listing. Um, but for, the, for by and large, I think pocket listings really benefit uh, the listing broker. Um, it doesn't really benefit consumers. If you think about a seller, Lisa and her team have done some research that says if you, if you list your home off MLS, you're leaving about $54,000 on the table. So as a seller, you're not getting the most bang for your buck because you're not having it on the open market where everybody can kind of look at it and let the open market drive the price. And if you're a buyer, especially in this area, um, in, this, in this environment of really restricted inventory, um, if you don't have access to every home for sale, you're really missing out. And um, pocket listings really market themselves to an exclusive set of buyers. Now, the word exclusive uh, inherently is the opposite of inclusive. So I think uh, pocket listings to me are, um, I don't think they should be there for the most part. I mean, Bright MLS has rules against pocket listings. We require that brokers uh, input their listings into the MLS within a certain time frame so that everybody has access to that same uh, set of property information that can make their best educated decision on is that property right for them. Uh, and Congressman, you represent Prince George's County, which as you well know, has had ups and downs involving home ownership. Uh, particularly minority home ownership. Uh, what are some of the biggest housing issues do you th that you've found over the years in your district? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the real estate bubble that burst um, and, and the uh, crash was, was very damaging to uh, major segments of Prince George's County. We've, we've just sort of dug our way out of that. And then you kind of run into the high interest rates and other issues along those lines. The other challenge I think that's uh, coming from an affordability standpoint is now people in Washington, D.C. are finally figuring out that, wow, I could buy a house. I'm, I live in Chevrolet uh, and work on Capitol Hill. You can, you can see the Capitol Dome from the top of the hill mm. on my street. Uh, so it's a great commute. Um, and, you know, for people who uh, want to have quick access to, let's, when I was working as, a, as an attorney, it was quick access to the courts, uh, to downtown, to the development as it came east. Uh, all of that worked well. So the market's going up because now you're getting more demand um, in, in those communities from people who hadn't been looking in parts of Prince George's, especially along the D.C. border. Uh, and as that takes off, it's good for the people who were there already, like me. It makes it tougher for, for first-time buyers, though. Like, I've, I've got six kids. They're all adults now. Three have bought houses. The other three are trying to figure it out. Uh, and part of it is this, the affordability piece and the down payment piece. You know, how do you, how do you come up with enough money to buy in so you can ante up and get in there? And it was especially challenging during the competitive period where you had cash, pe you know, people coming in with, with cash um, up front. And these are folks like my kids who were, you can come up with some of a down payment, but having 100% cash is very hard to do when you're 25, 30, or even 35. Right. I, in fact, one of my uh, next door neighbors did exactly uh, what you're talking about. I live on Capitol Hill. They looked at Chevrolet. They had two young children, and they moved to Chevrolet, and they're really, really happy. Uh, but as you mentioned, um, the price uh, the prices of homes have gone up. Uh, I looked up in Prince George's County. I think the the price has gone up about 50 percent over the past five years. Again. Great news for those who already have properties, but very, very tough for those who do not. And Lisa, um, I was just reading uh, about uh, there's been yet another surge of these cash payments uh, by people that are just th that if they're whether they're baby boomers or whoever they are, if they have the cash, they're making those purchases. But obviously, that makes it tougher. Uh, for others, as Congressman Ivey pointed out. No, it, it really is. It, it really is tough to be competing against these cash offers. And uh, we know in our market, about a third of home sales in 2023, a third were all cash offers. Wow. That's the highest share that we've had uh, since we've been keeping track for the last two decades. And it's not only the folks who are bringing 100% cash. It's a lot of those folks who maybe have sold a home and they had a, accumulated a tremendous amount of equity in that home or able to roll that home into the next purchase. And as you mentioned, affordability is a rising challenge for folks across the Washington, D.C. area. 
And so there has been this movement towards more affordable areas, which has included Prince George's County, which means that there's more demand actually in Prince George's than there has been in many other parts of the region. And that's put a lot of pressure on local residents who may be now competing not only with cash buyers, but cash buyers from all, all around the Washington area. And that just goes back to the point of when inventory is so low, it's so important for those buyers who are in the market to uh, be able to see all of the homes that are available for sale. Because um, in our uh, research, we're finding that people are still having to put offers on two, three homes on average before they're successful, um, which means that knowing what homes are available becomes increasingly important if you're, if you're that first time home buyer. And are we still at the point where a lot of it, you mentioned Amit, uh, the word of mouth, like sometimes we know that some homes actually sell before they're ever on the market. Is that still happening a fair amount? Yeah, it's not happening quite as much as it was during the height of the pandemic, but it does happen. And it actually can be problematic in those pocket listed situations that, that we were just talking about. Uh, in our research, um, these office exclusives or pocket listings, in the Washington area, they tend to be more highly concentrated in majority white neighborhoods than in more diverse neighborhoods. Those exclusive networks of buyers and, and uh, are being offered homes that other folks may not be able to have access to. And that ends up being problematic for fair housing reasons and, and just generally in this very tight housing market, giving people fewer options. All right, well, we're going to pick up on some of those challenges in our next segment because there are a lot of challenges, uh, unfortunately, for a lot of people who are out there trying to buy their first home. Uh, so that ends our first segment. Again, my guests today are Amit Kulkarni, the Chief Marketing Officer for Bright MLS, Dr. Lisa Sturdivant, the Chief Economist for Bright MLS, and Congressman Glenn Ivey, the U.S. Representative for Maryland's 4th District.